everybody. Welcome once again to Calvary Chapel Lemon Grove's new method for putting its weekly service out there for people to enjoy. So uh, we wanted to first of all welcome you. We're going to open in a word of prayer and then my son Michael is going to read Psalm 95 and we're going to move into a time of worship and then a teaching and a time of communion. So let's, let's open in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for this day. And we thank you for this opportunity. It's such a privilege to go anywhere or do anything in your name. And uh, we just make ourselves available to you now. We ask, Lord, that you would move in the hearts of your people, in the hearts and minds. And just uh, help us, Lord, to become all that you want us to be. And help us, Lord, to know what you want us to do and how you want us to serve you. And help us, Lord, to keep our minds and our hearts focused on you, regardless of the circumstances we find ourselves in. We love you and we praise you for this day in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And Michael, if you would like to read Psalm 95 for us, please. Psalm 95. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is the great God. And the great king above all gods, in his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me. They tried me, though they saw my work. For forty years I was grieved with that generation, and said, It is a people who go astray in their hearts, and they do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. All right, thank you, Michael. And now we're going to turn things over to the worship team. So worship team, take it away.
got to tell you that we miss you and we love you and we're looking forward to the day when we can gather together to, uh, together again in person and now uh, today being Palm Sunday uh, the day commonly referred to as Palm Sunday the day we commemorate Jesus triumphal entry into Jerusalem why don't you go ahead and turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke chapter 19 we're going to take a little detour from our first by verse study through the book of Romans for today and for next week as well. Today we're in Luke chapter 19, verses 28 through 44, beginning in verse 28. When he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass, when he came near to Bethphage and Bethany, at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite you, where as you enter you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Loose him and bring him here. And if anyone asks you, why are you loosing him? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of him. So those who were sent departed and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, why are you loosing the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of him. Then they brought him to Jesus. And they threw their own garments on the colt, and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, they spread their clothes on the road. Then, as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for the, all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. So now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you, and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. Father, we pause once more to ask for that inspirational, instructional work of your Spirit. Lord, that you would teach us. Open our eyes and renew our minds. It is good for us to be with you. We find peace in your presence. By your grace, May we be fed in our inner person. May your spirit take the bread of your word and nourish us for the glory and honor of our Lord and King, Christ Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Now, in the year 345 B.C., next slide, please, a great general by the name of Philip gave a beautiful black stallion to his young son, Alexander. Alexander tamed and trained that stallion. He named that horse Bucephalus, who would go on to become perhaps the most famous horse in all of antiquity. You see, it was on Bucephalus's back that Alexander the Great 
rode into countless battles and into cities that he had triumphantly conquered. What a sight it must have been to see Alexander the Great on that beautiful beast's back. Surely it was an impressive sight as he rode on that horse with his soldiers marching behind him. Behind the soldiers were the prisoners that they had taken captive in the conquering of that city. Next slide, please. What a scene. Now contrast that with another who rode into a city almost 400 years later. This one didn't ride into the city on the back of a beautiful black stallion. No, this one rode on a donkey's back. And on that Palm Sunday, April of A.D. 32, Jesus the Christ came riding in his triumphal entry on the back of a donkey. What a contrast between Alexander the Great and Jesus the Christ. It's truly intriguing. Alexander the Great and Jesus the Christ both started their careers as young men, and they both died at the age of 33. But the similarity ends there. Alexander the Great was born in a mansion. Jesus the Christ was born in a manger. Alexander the Great was born the son of a king. Jesus the Christ was born the son of a carpenter, or so it seemed. Alexander the Great had a successful life. And at the end of his life, he was seemingly the most successful man who had ever lived. Next slide. Jesus the Christ. His life was controversial. And at its end, it seemed as though he was a miserable failure, pinned to the cross like a common criminal. When Alexander the Great died, he died in the splendor of Babylon. When Jesus the Christ died, he died in squalor outside of Jerusalem. Alexander and Jesus so very different. Alexander the Great would seemingly be the winner, the model, the successful one. But wait, consider with me. Alexander the Great shed the blood of millions for his own gain. Jesus the Christ shed his own blood for the gain of millions. Alexander the Great conquered people, but Jesus the Christ, he liberated people. Next slide, please. When Alexander the Great conquered his last country, he cried before his followers, there are no more worlds to conquer, and he wept like a baby. Jesus the Christ, in his final days, comforted his disciples and would say, there's a better world coming. Let not your hearts be troubled. Alexander the Great made history. Jesus the Christ transformed history. Alexander the Great conquered lives, but Jesus the Christ conquered death. The contrast between them is seen most vividly as they make their triumphal entries into their respective cities. Alexander rode into Athens on Bucephalus. Jesus rode into Jerusalem, not on a famous stallion's back, but on the back of a nameless donkey. Why? Next slide, please. On this Palm Sunday, in the text and in our mind's eye, we see Jesus riding into Jerusalem on the back of a nameless donkey. Why would he choose such an animal upon which he would come into the city? The Romans, who were in the city at that time, they must have snickered at the sight. Look at their so-called king riding on the back of a donkey. It probably seemed almost humorous to them. Why would Jesus do this? I'd like to suggest three reasons for you to think through, maybe even jot down, certainly to be aware of. Next slide, please. Why would Jesus come into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey? First, to fulfill Bible prophecy. You see, hundreds of years before this event took place, that is, before Jesus came in on that donkey's back, the prophet Zechariah wrote, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. In other words, you're going to know when your king comes, because he's going to come into the city, meek and lowly, riding on the back of a donkey. And that verse is one of more than 300 prophecies 
They clearly and pointedly spoke about Jesus Christ's first coming in the Old Testament. Old Testament prophecies told where Jesus would be born, how he would be born, the way he would live, the manner in which he would be betrayed, the torturous death that he would endure on the cross at Calvary, at Mount Moriah, as specifically mentioned in the Old Testament. Prophecy after prophecy after prophecy was given that the people might know that this is indeed Messiah, the promised one. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, was one of those prophecies. You'll know him because he'll come into the city, O Zion, O Jerusalem, on the back of a donkey. You can't miss him. Zechariah mentioned that he was coming and that he was bringing salvation. He wasn't coming to bring political power or military movement. He came to bring salvation. And as Jesus was approaching the city, riding on that donkey's back, he realized that they just didn't get it. They didn't know Bible prophecy, you see. They were just looking at this man to set them free from the powers over them, the Romans. They were hoping that he would a, lead a military or a political movement that would set them free. And Jesus realized that they just didn't get it. They didn't know. And so we read in verse 42 of chapter 19 of Luke's Gospel, that when he came to the city, he cried. He wept. And he said, oh, if you had known, even you, in this your day, the things that make for your peace. And in verse 44, he ended the passage before us by saying, but you didn't know the time of your visitation. Pray tell. Why was he crying? Why did he weep? Because they didn't understand the significance of this, their day. What does that mean? Simply this, Daniel the prophet, in the ninth chapter of his book, said, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the coming of Messiah the Prince shall be sixty-nine weeks, or sixty-nine heptads in the Hebrew. That's a unit of seven, meaning seven days, as in a week, or seven years. They would also call that a week. Know this, when the commandment is given to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, Jerusalem, until Messiah comes, will be 69 sevens, or 69 times seven, 483 years. Now, check out secular history. On March 14th, 445 BC, Artaxerxes told the Jews there in Babylon, who were there in captivity for 70 years, go home, restore and rebuild Jerusalem. Get out of here. March 14th, 445 BC. Take that date, which is recorded in secular history, and go 483 years from that date using the Jewish or Babylonian calendars, which contain 360 days per year. 483 years times 363, excuse me, 360 days per year works out to 173,880 days. Check it out for yourself. March 14th. 445 BC, 173,880 days, takes you to April 6, 32 AD, the very day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem as Messiah, the King. That's why he wept, and he said, you should have known. You should have known that this is your day. And you should understand all the prophecy there in Daniel chapter 9, where it declares that Messiah will be cut off, killed. But not for himself, though. You should understand the full plan. You should know the Bible. And Jesus wept over the city because they didn't know Bible prophecy. They completely missed it. How about you? You see, there aren't just prophecies related to his first coming. There are also hundreds of prophecies related to his second coming as well. And I wonder if perhaps Jesus, in a sense, doesn't weep, saying, how could it be that my people, who are called by my name, don't know their Bibles, don't understand prophecy. Next slide. They don't know that my coming is near, even at the very door. For you see, concerning his second coming, Jesus said, know this, the generation that sees the budding of the fig tree will see my coming. It shall not pass away. Throughout the Bible, the fig tree 
is the national symbol or emblem of Israel. For nearly 2,000 years, from the year AD 70 until May 14, 1948, the nation of Israel did not exist. The people were scattered all over the world, wandering, homeless. And then a miracle happened, something that had never previously happened in world history. A dead nation budded back into life. Just like seemingly dead trees are now bursting out with fresh leaves. And you say, hey, life has returned to them. So too, the fig tree, Israel, suddenly burst into buds. And Jesus said, when that happens, know this, that my coming is near, even at the very door. We are part of that generation. I am personally convinced that our generation will not pass away without seeing Jesus Christ, the Messiah, coming for the second time. Israel will soon celebrate its 72nd birthday since it was reestablished as a nation. Jesus' second coming has to happen soon. Just a few days ago, former British Prime Minister Gordon Brown, who was Prime Minister and leader of Britain's Labour Party from 2007 to 2010, called for the creation of a global government to cope with the coronavirus pandemic. He said, this is not something that can be dealt with in one country. There has to be a coordinated global response. Nigel Farage, leader of the UK's Brexit party, responded by saying, Gordon Brown doesn't get it. Globalization is the cause of our problems, not our savior. And perhaps you've heard of the ID2020 Alliance. They define themselves as a global partnership, maximizing the potential of digital ID to improve lives, saying that the ability to prove, prove who you are is a fundamental and universal human right. Because we live in a digital era, we need a trusted and reliable way to do that, both in the physical world and online. Now, it's not a great leap from there to implantation of microchips as a requirement to buying or selling. The technology is already out there, it's already been developed. Many have called for the elimination of cash because uh, of its potential to contribute to the spreading of the coronavirus. Why not just use a microchip, right? It could happen. Don't fall for it. Don't let them suck you in or implant a microchip in you. Your hope is not in the microchip. It's not in ID 2020. It's not in the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Your hope is in Jesus Christ alone. Turn to him now while there is yet time. He's coming soon, and I believe that with all of my heart. Prophecies unfolding before our very eyes. But are we like the people in Jesus' day, blind? Would Jesus say to us, don't you see that the day is at hand? My coming is near, even at the very door. So many just don't get it. They're looking for a political solution. Next slide. Jesus came riding on a donkey, number one, to fulfill Bible prophecy. Secondly, he came riding on a donkey to depict, to illustrate, to convey his personality. What is his personality? Well, Alexander the Great was pompous, prideful, riding on the back of Bucephalus, preening, prancing. Not so with Jesus. Zechariah said that Jesus would come in a lowly manner on a donkey's back. Jesus? What about him? Well, he made one autobiographical statement about his personality. What was that? I'll read it to you. You can mark it down. It's a great verse, one that you might know well. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And there it is. That's the only time Jesus ever described his personality, when he said, I am meek and I am lowly. He didn't prance. He didn't preen. He wasn't unapproachable. He was meek. He was lowly. He was touchable available to any who are weary or heavy laden. You don't have to shy away from him. He didn't ride on a high horse, no. 
He just said, come to me. I'm on the back of a donkey, you see. And I love it. It conveys his personality. That's why he came on the back of a donkey. He's meek and lowly, humble and available. He's touchable and approachable. That's my king. That's my friend, Jesus Christ. Next slide, please. Number three. He came on a donkey's back, not only to fulfill Bible prophecy and to convey his personality, but also to depict humanity. He rode on a donkey. Why? To depict who he uses and the way he works. You remember that in our text, Jesus told those going to get the donkey, if anyone asks you why you're loosing the donkey, tell them the Lord has need of him. What? The Lord has need of a donkey? You bet. In Philippians chapter 2, we're told that the Lord laid aside his powers and his prerogatives to a great degree. And he did what? He became like us by his own choice. He put himself in a position where he would need people like you and me. He would need to borrow a manger in which to be born. He would need to borrow a boat from which to preach. He would need to borrow a grave in which to be buried. He needed loaves and fishes to miraculously multiply. In other words, he puts himself in a position of partnership. I need a donkey. I need a boat. I need a grave in which to bury me. Amazing. He needs you too. And you say, not me. I'm so stubborn. I'm nothing. I know there's a time in life when we're preening and we're proud. We look in the mirror and we think, hmm, not too shabby. But there also comes a time when you look in the mirror and you realize, hee-haw, I'm a donkey. At some point in life, every man, every woman, gets off their high horse and realizes what they are, a donkey. The English writer and philosopher G.K. Chesterton who has been referred to as the Prince of Paradox, once said, when fishes flew and forests walked, when figs grew upon thorns, when at some moment the moon turned to blood, then surely I was born, with a monstrous head and sickening cry, and ears like errant wings, the devil's walking parody of all four-footed things. I'm the tattered outlaw of the earth, of ancient crooked will. Starve me, scourge me, deride me, I am dumb, but I keep my secrets still. Fools, for I also had my hour, one hour, fierce and sweet, when around my head I heard cries of joy and palm branches at my feet. The story of the donkey, that's me. There comes a time when we realize that hell is where we belong. But Jesus says, Sean, I know who you are, and I have need of you. This is the key. I want you to see this very carefully. Don't tune out. Please listen. Notice, first of all, the donkey, ridden as it depicts humanity. Jesus chooses to ride the donkey, people like you and me. He chooses to use the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and the weak things of the world to confound the strong. He chooses donkeys. He needs them. He wants to use them. And when I'm being ridden by Jesus Christ, suddenly and only, my life has meaning. You see, with the Lord steering me, and the Lord using me, and the Lord in charge of me, and riding on me, and ruling over me, only then does my life have purpose and meaning. Like the donkey in G.K. Chesterton's poem. That's my secret. You might see me as a donkey, but I know something. The Lord loves me and uses me in spite of me. That's what gives my life meaning. It's not my hobbies or my toys or my trinkets or my car or my home. Those things are meaningless, empty, frustrating, vanity in and of themselves. The time when you feel fulfilled and excited about life is the time when you let the Lord have control of your life. And you say, use me, Lord, even though I am but a donkey. Use me, 
Let me share your love as I teach the word or bake a cake or mow someone's lawn in your name or hold a home Bible study or meet in a prayer circle, whatever it might be. Use me, Lord. Because I realize that unless you use me, I'm nothing more than an unfulfilled donkey. The donkey was ridden by the Lord, but, next slide please. Take note, Bible students. Before the donkey could be ridden by the Lord, he first had to be released for the Lord. Loose him, loose him. He was tied up and he had to be released before he could be used. So too, with you and me, we donkeys, you see. We have to be loosed. We have to be released before we can be effectively ridden. Well, what does that mean? Think back to a time, a couple of days before this event, that Jesus came to Bethany. Lazarus was in the tomb. He was dead. His corpse was decaying for three days. And Jesus then did a miracle. He told Mary and Martha to roll away the stone. And with a loud voice, he cried, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came out of the tomb. And then Jesus told his disciples, now you guys, you unwind him. I've resurrected him. But here's your job. Unwind him. You see, Jesus Christ has resurrected you. You're born again. I know that. But many of us are still bound up in the grave clothes of the old lifestyle, in bondage still to the old addictions. And how does Jesus release you? He releases you the same way that he released Lazarus. Through his disciples, the laying on of hands, the prayer, the sharing of the word, the intercession, the interaction, the word of prophecy, the word of knowledge, gifts of healing. That's the way the Lord releases donkeys like you and me through his disciples. So why then do we forsake those times when we can get together to pray for each other? Whether in person, over the phone, via video teleconference, etc. It ought not to be. Before you can be ridden, you must be released. But wait, there's one more step. Before you can be ridden, you must be released. But before you can be released, you must be redeemed. Well, what do you mean? I'll refer you to a little known passage in the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 13. I'll read it for you. Exodus chapter 13, verse 13 says, But every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. And if you will not redeem it, then you shall break its neck. You see, when a donkey was born, the only way that donkey could live was if a lamb was killed in its place. Otherwise, the donkey's neck had to be broken. Being a stubborn creature, the donkey depicts me. In that passage from Exodus, God was saying most graphically through his word, if a donkey is going to live, he's got to first be redeemed by the blood of a lamb. And that's an interesting Old Testament regulation. Next slide, please. Where you see... As we're told, Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God. His blood was shed for a donkey like me. But if I refuse the work that he did on Calvary, if I say, I don't need him, I don't need that, I'm okay. If I make such statements, then I will be cut off, eternally doomed and damned. And you say, John, you sure sound like a fundamentalist when you, you, you say such things. Well... Listen, label me what you will, but the fact of the matter is that God's word declares, he that has the Son, Jesus Christ, has life, but he that has not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. The neck of the donkey must be broken, unless it's redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Next slide. If anyone that is watching this service on this Palm Sunday, and you refuse to receive the redemption the blood of the Lamb, and you say, I realize that I'm a donkey, I'm a sinner. Lord, forgive me. If you refuse to receive it, you are as stubborn as any mule and as dumb as a donkey. But if you say, Lord, I know what I am. I'm a sinner, and I need to be forgiven. Well, today is your day, the day of your visitation, the day when Jesus rides into your city and takes authority over your life and cleanses you from your sin, you are set free today, if you'll believe. If you're a believer here, 
but you're not being used because you're all bound up in your own problems, in your own addictions, in your own struggles, in your own sins. Today is the day when the Lord would say, loose him. I have need of him. I have need of her. I want to use you. Loose him. Loose her. At the hand of the disciples. You contact us. There's an email address in the notes related to this message. And on the slide, you send us an email. You say to the pastors, to the workers, man, I'm all bound up. Would you please pray for me? I want to be loosed. You who don't know the Lord yet, I have a question for you. Is there any good reason why you should not accept Jesus Christ right now? If you're struggling with fear, doubt, guilt, uncertainty, shame, you can get rid of all that right now. Right now, right where you are, in the quiet and the privacy of your own home, you can accept Jesus Christ into your heart. You can say, well, Sean, yes, I want that peace in my heart. I want to know that if I was to die tonight, that I would be going to heaven. Next slide. You can know that right now. The first step toward that peace and assurance is recognizing that you're a sinner. Some people might struggle with that. They think, hey, I'm not such a bad person. I do my best. I pay my taxes on time. I certainly do better than that person over there next to me. But the Bible tells us, in the book of Romans, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The first step to peace with God is accepting full responsibility for your sins. The next step is to recognize that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. We've already established that every one of us has a sin problem. Our sin creates separation between us and God. Because there was no other way to resolve our sin problem, God sent his own son to die in our place on the cross of Calvary. If there was any other way to be redeemed, then Jesus Christ did not need to go to the cross, and his sacrifice on the cross was in vain. It was a waste, but that is not the case. It is the only way. The Bible tells us that God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It says so in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. When did God start loving you? While you were yet a sinner, not after you polished up your act. Jesus said that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So, First, you need to accept responsibility for your sins. Next, you need to recognize that Jesus Christ died on the cross to pay the price for those sins. You must also repent of your sins. In Acts chapter 17, verse 30, the Bible tells us that God commands all people everywhere to repent. What does that word repent mean? It means you've been going the wrong way in life. You need to make a U-turn, and you need to start going God's way. Instead of running from God, you can run to him. Once you repent of your sins, you must receive Jesus Christ into your life. And Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Being a Christian isn't merely believing a creed or even going to a particular church. You can do those things and still not have Jesus Christ in your heart. There must come a moment in every person's life when he or she says, Lord, come in. God's word tells us that as many as believed Jesus and accepted him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. And lastly, you must receive Jesus Christ right now. The Bible tells us that today is the day of salvation. Life is fragile. And the simple truth is that none of us is guaranteed another day. This could be the last opportunity you have to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you can never again plead ignorance because you have now heard the truth. What in the world are you waiting for? In just a moment, we're going to celebrate communion. Jesus told us to remember, to commemorate what he did for us. And we love to do just that on a regular basis. The celebration, however, 
will be meaningless and offensive to God if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But you can do that right now. Then communion will be especially meaningful to you. If you'd like to accept Jesus Christ into your heart right now, then simply pray this prayer along with me and mean it in your heart. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I believe you died for my sins. Right now, I turn from my sins, and I open the door of my heart and my life. I confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. Help me, Lord, to live my life for you from this day forth. In Jesus' name, amen. And if you just prayed that prayer, welcome to the family of God. Please tell someone that you've accepted Jesus Christ. Send us an email because we'd like to celebrate with you. We have some free materials to send you. They'll help you grow in your walk with the Lord. May God richly bless you. And now, just a little devotion as we prepare for communion. Many of us who uh, are beyond the years of playing computer games will remember a hobby that gave us a sense of accomplishment with little expense, but lots of effort. Model making. Perhaps it's just a sign of antiquity, my old age. But many remember getting a box of parts, which, with diligence and a sparing use of glue, eventually came together to be a scale model of a ship, a plane, or a vehicle. Everything in the model was built to scale, a smaller copy which preserves the detail of the larger. For the younger modeler, it was a personal thrill to display the model to someone who had served on the original ship or flown the life-size plane. It was especially rewarding when that person could identify it without being prompted. Oh, that's a P-51. Models have a fine use in our lives. They represent the essence of the thing being modeled. No one would model an aircraft carrier and paint it pink, though as an Air Force guy I have to admit that would be a tempting idea. But by use of the model that we identify, we honor and we symbolize. Did you know there's a model in the Old Testament? Indeed there is. You may find reference to it in 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 18. Some use model, others use pattern. We know that the Israelite was told to make no graven image, no models of deities, so to speak. But David was given the pattern of this model the chariot of the cherubim. It is a curious phrase, that, but it is a model given to David for Solomon's use in building the temple. It's not known if the cherubim were placed in a chariot or whether this reminds us that God mounted the cherubim and flew. We do know that these were patterned after the model. Communion is rather like that, too. It's a model of our Lord's sacrifice on the cross. It's a model in the sense of being a portrait. This is my body. It is a simple thing, but the act that it models for us is clearly seen. Communion is greater than that, though. Each time you take communion, you proclaim the Lord's death, the death of atonement. But do you not also see that this is the model for the martyrs of the church? The early martyrs died in the way that Christ did, not just in method, but in steadfast refusal to betray their Lord. The reminder is still there. Perhaps we shall see martyrs in our own time. Once more, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We must be content with the model now. But the time is coming soon. Soon, Lord, soon, please. When we will see, we will see him face to face. Until then, we have the pattern, the model, in communion. Where two or three are gathered in his name, there he is also. And when the form of the model then, face to face with the living God. And now, uh, just turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, to give you an idea of how communion was originally celebrated. In 
1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul starts out by saying, imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Well, later on in that chapter, he says in verse 23 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, like this bread here. And when he had given thanks, he broke the bread and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake of the bread together. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let's partake of the cup together. Father, Father, we thank you so much for the privilege it is to remember what you have done for us, the price you paid for us, the horrible, ugly, yet beautiful death that your Son endured on our behalf. We commit this day and this time to you now and ask you, Lord, to send us forth, ready to do your will in whatever manner and means you deem appropriate. We make ourselves available to you. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close with the words of the Lord's song, shall we?
be the, uh, the prayer of our hearts. May that be the focus of our lives. And may Lord just give you a beautiful week. May he pour out his spirit upon you. May he bless you beyond measure. May he protect you. May he open up his windows of blessing and pour them out on you. And I have a challenge for you. And the challenge is, while we're all kind of cooped up at home, it's almost like God is telling the world to slow down. Maybe take stock. It's a good time to do that. It's a good opportunity to draw closer to him, the one who created you, the one who saved you, the one who died for you. It's time to draw close to him. As I was telling you, I believe his coming is soon. So spend some time in his word. Spend some time in fellowship with him, just you and you alone with him. That's when he'll speak to you. He will reveal himself to you. He'll make his way known to you. And he'll give you that perfect peace which passes all understanding. He will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus our Lord. And now the Lord bless thee. The Lord bless thee. And keep thee. And keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee. And be gracious unto thee. And be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up, the Lord lift up his, countenance his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. God bless you.